So last summer I sailed a sailing yacht through the Northwest Passage in the Canadian Arctic and um, sailed through a lot of ice and a lot of very grisly conditions. It was a 40-foot sailing boat and uh, I was the captain of it. We had three crew, so four of us all together on a 40-foot boat for four months. You can imagine some of the tensions that that might generate. We sailed 15,000 kilometers, which is equal to crossing the North Atlantic about three times. So it was a heck of a journey. And normally, as you can probably guess, the Arctic is covered by ice, especially in the wintertime. It's nearly impossible to get through on a yacht or even on an icebreaker. In the summertime, there's also a lot of ice in the Arctic. But um, in historically, for mariners to get through the Arctic has been a great challenge because of the ice. You may have heard of Sir John Franklin, a British captain who went up into the Arctic with two ships trying to find the passage that I ended up sailing. He went up there with two ships and 128 men. He was frozen into the ice. And uh, Franklin's men started eating each other in an attempt to survive, and they failed. They all died and their ships sank. Well, climate change has changed all that. It's no longer quite as hard to get through the Northwest Passage as it used to be. The sea ice is melting more and more every year because of climate change. And it's become much easier to get through the Northwest Passage now than it used to be. You can now be confident when you leave Victoria, like I did, that you're going to be able to get through the Arctic in one summer. You can be confident. It's not surefire, but you can be fairly confident you'll be able to get through in one summer. So it's a grand thing to do. It's a great adventure, especially if you're a sailor such as myself. I love sailing, and this was something that really appealed to me. It's still one of the greatest sailing challenges out there for yachtsmen, and far fewer people have sailed this route than have climbed Everest. So it's a fair sailing challenge, even with climate change, making it a little bit easier. But I'm also a journalist. I'm a very passionate sailor, and I've always been a journalist. And when I started researching this expedition, I realized that I would be sailing through the scene of perhaps one of the greatest stories of our time, which is climate change. And I'd be on the scene. And as a journalist, I couldn't pass that up. And I started researching it. And initially, this was supposed to be a chance for me to quit my job and become a sail bum and just kind of hang out on a boat. But very quickly... I created a job for myself, which was far harder than anything I'd ever tackled before. And the goal for the expedition became to sail through the Northwest, Northwest Passage, to sail through the Canadian Arctic, and to do that without any assistance, but at the same time, to tell the story of the people that live in the Arctic, and to tell their story of how they are interacting with climate change. That's the story that I want to tell you today. I want to tell you about the people that live at the front line of climate change in the, in the Arctic. Now, I'm going to show you a few pictures in this presentation that you may find a little distasteful or a little gory, and I do apologize, but they do help tell this story. So please, don't avert your eyes, just uh, swallow hard. The people that live in the Arctic are called the Inuit, and they are some of the first people in the world to feel climate change in a day-to-day -day way in their lives. Here in Hong Kong, especially in this room, we have a lot of very intelligent people that are up with current issues. We all know about climate change. Politicians talk about it a lot. In Hong Kong, maybe it's not discussed enough, but there's a lot of discussion about it. Companies weave climate change into their corporate social responsibility programs, and it's in the public discourse. We all know about it. We read about it. We talk about it. But no one here, when you wake up in the morning, no one here has to do plan their day differently because of climate change. Yes, you may do things to save energy, but climate change is not forcing you to live your life differently than you used to live it. Well, I'd like you to meet Ellen. Ellen is someone whose life is being impacted on a daily basis because of climate change. She is learning to live with climate change. She lives in Wales, Alaska, which is a small village right in the Bering Strait, where Russia and Alaska are very close to each other. She lives in this small community. We stopped in there on, with our yacht and visited the hunters that live there. And they told us a lot of stories about how the animals are changing, the land is changing, and it was all very interesting. But 
we went to her house, and it was something that Ellen told me that, was, that really stuck with me, and perhaps because she was a very quiet woman, very diminutive woman, and when she did speak, I thought I should probably listen. While we were visiting with her, we were in her home, she had this massive basket of greens she'd picked out on the tundra. It's the, one of, there's only a few weeks in the summer in the Arctic that you can actually go out and get vegetation from the land, and she'd pick these greens kind of like a spinach, and she was mixing them with seal oil, kind of like a salad. Sounds a bit disgusting. I tried it. It was actually quite delicious. And as she was working, she was listening to the hunters, and finally she spoke up. And Ellen told me a story about going out and picking salmon berries as a young girl. She said that when I was a little child, we'd go out picking salmon berries. She goes, we'd go at the same time every year, kind of early August, around there is when the salmon berries ripen. She said every year, all the ladies in the community get together, little girls to the grandmothers. We all go out on the land, we pick salmon berries. She says, we've done it for generations. It's always been the way we do things. She goes, in the last four or five years, she noticed a real difference. Instead of the salmon berries ripening in early August, the salmon berries were now ripening in mid-July, three weeks earlier than they used to. Well, big deal, right? Some berries ripening in the Arctic a bit earlier. But then Alan said, she goes, she pointed out, at the, at the tundra outside our window, and she goes, this is where we get our food. This is our grocery store. She goes, I'm getting really worried. She goes, how will I feed my children? She said, it's, yes, it's the berries ripening early. But she says, I'm worried because there's lots of little changes we see. She goes, and this is how we feed our families. So Ellen is one person who is dealing with climate change on a day-to-day -day basis in her life. She is seeing her food security at threat because she relies on the land for a lot of her food. Now, I have to admit, I was a little bit skeptical when I first started meeting Inuit people and they were telling me about how they rely on the land for their food. Because they live in pretty modern looking houses, they have satellite TV, they have video games, and they live kind of quite modern lives in many aspects. But as I traveled through the Arctic, I started realizing how true this was, what they were telling me. And I learned more about their life and, and realized that well, here in Hong Kong, if we want Arctic greens tossed with seal oil, you can maybe go check at Great or City Super. I'm not sure if they sell that. But if they do, you could pay a lot of money and probably get it. Otherwise, you can go to Welcome and just get your normal lettuce. We have it pretty easy. But as I traveled, I learned that it's not quite so easy for them to buy food and that the land really is very important to them. I'd like you to meet Jean. Jean lived in a community named Ulahaktak. And she was a traditional teacher, traditional educator, grandmother, and a very wise woman. And she told me, she said, there's two main reasons why we rely so heavily on the land and why this is still so important for us and why it's relevant. She said that, first of all, food is very expensive in the Arctic. And we noticed that. We'd go to grocery stores. And if you pick up a jug of milk, check the price it was four times as expensive as it would be if you bought it in Toronto or Vancouver. Four times as expensive for a liter of milk. That same pricing applied to eggs, meat, any other fresh food. Because the Arctic communities are very, very remote. And in order to get their food, they have to fly it in. Unless it's something that can be brought in once a year and stored. So all of their fresh food is being flown in on a regular basis, making it very expensive. Unless they can go out on the land and hunt it. Now, adding to that pricing problem is the fact that a lot of the Arctic communities are economically depressed. It's very hard to find a good paying job. It's very hard to start a business in the Arctic. And therefore, it's very difficult for them to afford a lot of this food. So for a lot of these families, going out and hunting is a matter of necessity. They need to do this in order to get the food they need to feed their families. Jean told me what the second reason is. She said that hunting and living off the land is very important for maintaining their culture. Now, when I was chatting with Jean, she was on the beach with her daughter, Julia, and a little granddaughter named Estina. And they were on the beach and they were skinning seals. Um, their, uh, Jean's husband had just come back, and he'd just come back from seal hunting, and he brought back about a dozen seals. And they were skinning them on the beach as we were chatting. And Jean told me that even... The, the kids, they're kind of lost touch with who they are. They've got TV, they've got video games, they've got junk food. They'd sort of forgotten what it meant to be Inuit. And they had lost their ties to their history and to their identity. And 
a lot of these communities are really struggling with some social issues. Substance abuse, domestic abuse, and many of these issues can be tied to a lack of identity, a lack of self-worth, a lack of pride, because they have lost that connection with the land. And this is especially the case with young men in the communities. So hunting helps restore that, and it helps them remind them who they are and why they live in such a godforsaken, barren land. It's because they hunt and they're tied to the land, and that is what their identity is. And she said that being able to do things like this, skin seals on the beach with her little three-year-old granddaughter, meant that she could teach her granddaughter about what it meant to be an Inuit. She could speak Inuktitut to her granddaughter and teach her the native language that she'd grown up with. So we know that climate change is threatening the survival of some of the animals in the Arctic. If that's the case, as we know it is, that means that the Inuit culture and Inuit way of life and the Inuit pride in being Inuit is also at threat because of climate change. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Jacob. Jacob was a 70-year-old hunter who lived in a very small community called Joe Haven. And he had spent almost his entire life on the land hunting. And when I entered the Arctic, when I set off on this whole expedition and, and bought the boat and dreamt about all this, I had a lot of really romantic ideas of what I was going to find when I got to the Arctic. I had all these romantic notions that I'd picked up reading books. And almost in every case, those romantic notions were smashed. And Arctic life wasn't at all like what I thought it would be. But in this one instance, I found a little bit of what I'd been looking for, a little bit of that stereotype. And so Jacob and his son Silas, they shot two caribou out on the land. And they were really happy because caribou is kind of a delicacy. It's, if they can eat caribou all day long, that's what they'll do. Now, <laughs> now, they shot two caribou and they were skinning them out on the land. They were cutting up the meat. And we'd already eaten some caribou earlier in the trip. And we knew it was good. And I was looking at the caribou and thinking, hmm, there's some good steaks for the barbecue later. But Jacob was thinking something very differently. And he wasn't going to wait until later. Can you turn up the volume? Can you turn up the volume? I'm going to leave it. It tastes like. So what do you eat? Chai. <laughs> you want to eat chai? What did you call your dad and tell him if you're eating raw kidneys not? <laughs> Most people can have. That was raw caribou kidney if you missed that in the beginning. That's not why I introduced you to Jacob. I didn't want to tell you about Jacob. <laughs> So I could show you that video. But also because for Jacob, climate change is a matter of life and death. Because Jacob is a hunter, as I told you. Much of the Inuit hunting takes place out on the ice. Because on the ice is where the walruses are, the whales are, the bears, the seals. It's an entire ecosystem out there on the ice. And that's where a lot of the wildlife lives, out at sea on the ice. And for the Inuit, it's very difficult to travel without the ice. It's very difficult to travel on the seas because the seas can be quite rough. In wintertime, they will travel for hundreds of miles to hunt, to go visit relatives in another community, whatever. But wintertime is traveling time on the ice, and, and it's a time when they do a lot of their hunting. Now, Jacob told me a story that a lot of other hunters had mentioned to me already, and that is that while they used to be able to predict what would happen with the ice and how the ice would break up, particularly in the spring months when some of the, that's when some of the best hunting is to be had, he said that it used to be that we could read the ice. And when they said read the ice, they explained it to me as saying, well, they'd look at the wind, they'd look at the recent temperatures, they might even look at the phase of the moon. And they all, they all had their own kind of system of reading it, but it was a knowledge that had been passed down through the generations to read the ice and to understand when it was safe and when it was safe to be on the ice and when it was time to pack up and go back on shore. Well, that knowledge had, has become irrele irrelevant because of climate change. The hunters told me that they can no longer read what's going to happen because there's, climate change is affecting the weather systems in the Arctic to such great extent that the way they used to be able to read the weather no longer applies and they no longer know when the ice is going to break up. And it breaks up in strange new ways that they can't predict and they didn't expect. Things that are happening on the ice that they haven't seen in generations. So it's fair to say that climate change 
is affecting Jacob's life in a day-to-day way by making it more dangerous. His, life, his job as a hunter has become very dangerous because he can't read what's happening on the ice anymore. I want to introduce you to some of the kids in the Arctic. They don't all look like this. In fact, I think this may be a little lesson in what can happen to your brain if you go out without a warm hat. Look at the kid. He's got a warm hat. He looks normal. The other two. Um, but seriously, the kids in the Arctic were fantastic. They were funny, and, and there was a lot of them. Because the communities in the Arctic are very young. The average age in the Arctic is 20 years old. In Hong Kong, the average age is 42. I don't know where you are on that, but I'm still under average. Um, Often we talk about children these days and we say, man, kids are growing up in a rapidly changing world, aren't they? Well, in the Arctic, for the Arctic kids, that's literal. That's physical. The world they are growing up in is changing every day. And not just politically and economically. It's changing physically. Now, a lot of these kids are growing up in the Arctic in a very unpredictable environment. And everybody knows that when you raise a child, you want to raise them in a pretty stable, predictable environment but they don't have that. The world they're growing up in is changing. They're having to learn to deal with it. Now, they're going to see a lot of the results of climate change that we won't see. We won't be around to see them. But these kids will. They're going to see what happens with oil exploration in the Arctic. There's a lot of talk about that. There was some, uh, a company found a lot of oil just a week or two ago off the coast of Greenland. A lot of talk about drilling for oil in the Arctic now that the sea ice is disappearing. Well, Will that mean jobs, economic opportunities for these kids? Or will it mean that their pristine hunting lands are ruined by pollution? We don't know yet. They're going to find out, though. How about shipping through the Northwest Passage? There's a lot of talk about that because of climate change with the ice melting, commercial shipping will be possible through the Northwest Passage. The ice is disappearing. It's safe for container ships to come through, saving shipping companies a lot of miles and money. What will that mean for for these kids? What will it mean for their lives? That their communities that have been extremely isolated, communities that now only see maybe two ships a year, what if their community is suddenly on the shores of an international shipping channel? What's that going to mean? We don't know. They're going to find out, though. There's also a lot of sovereignty issues, a lot of issues tied to climate change, tied to policy in the north, and all these sort of things are going to play out in their lifetime. And they're living in a world that's going to be very, very different in 10, 15 years, 20 years than it is now. How about if they admire their father or uncle for their hunting skills and they say, I also want to be a hunter and live on the land, live off the land like my father did. Well, they might not be able to. We've heard about how wildlife is changing, how the threat, how the hunting traditions are changing We don't know if they can live off the land like their father did. You saw Jean skinning seals. That that skin, that fur, is used to make hats and gloves. It's some of the warmest clothing you can find in the Arctic. Well, who knows if they're going to need clothes that warm with climate change. There's a lot of very uncertain, there's a lot of uncertainty in their lives. Now, the schools in the Arctic, we visited several schools, and the kids are learning two kind of ways of life already. And they learn to live as the white man, as they call it. They, in order, if they want to go li- move south to Toronto or Vancouver or Winnipeg, they can go move south and live in a city and have a job and, and live in a modern economy as we know it. But the schools are also teaching them to survive out on the land and survive in the Arctic where they grew up. But one thing the schools can't teach them, one, one kind of lifestyle they can't prepare their children for is a lifestyle in the Arctic with climate change and all these issues and how they're going to play out because we don't know how they're going to play out. And we don't know what the Arctic's going to be like if climate change continues. We know that it's going to change. We know that the ice is going to melt. We know that their life will be very different. But it's very hard to prepare them for that right now. I want to leave you with these four faces and remind you that of Ellen of Jean, Jacob, and all the kids that are growing up in a very, very uncertain world in the Arctic. Climate change isn't about abstract ideas of economics and politics and policy. It's not just for public discourse. 
Climate change doesn't just happen in newspapers. It doesn't just happen on TV news. Climate change is happening for real. And it's affecting people's lives. It's not about these economics and policies. It's about people. And it's about how it affects people's lives. So today, climate change is impacting the Inuit in a day-to-day -day way. But if we don't do anything about climate change, tomorrow it'll be here in Hong Kong. It'll be you and I that have to adjust our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's think about that when we think about climate change. Thank you.